Yeah, thanks so much, Frank. And You're welcome. I'm just really excited to be at the Clark Historical Library, um, and which has uh, one of the great collections about the guy uh, who you now see on your screen, James Jesse Strang. And also, I got to say, a great staff of librarians, judging by my experience there. I want to particularly thank, before I even start, John Fierst. I want to thank you, Frank, and uh, just the Clark Library in general. Um, you may ask, why would a library have uh, a great collection on the guy I see on my screen? Well, that's a good question, because this guy, James Jesse Strang, uh, does not look like an impressive fellow. Um, and for much of his life, he wasn't an impressive fellow, but he ended up being a prophet and con man who, um, first in Wisconsin and later in uh, at Beaver Island in northernmost Lake Michigan, uh, started his own colony and indeed declared himself king of earth and heaven and attracted hundreds of followers from across the country and in some cases from other countries to his side. You may be watching the screen and saying, ah, why? <laughs> why is this guy uh, uh, so able to attract people? And I'm gonna read just one short section from the book and it's just a couple of paragraphs long, but I just thought it might give us some flavor for how we start our discussion on him today. Okay. Although James Jesse Strang was unimposing, a few inches over five feet and bald with an oddly bulging forehead, he did possess one distinguishing feature, his dark brown eyes, which one acquaintance described as rather small, but very bright and piercing, giving an extremely animated expression to his whole countenance. Another claimed that those eyes seemed as though they could bore right through a person but more than any tangible attribute, Strang possessed an invisible, ineffable aura called confidence. And in those days before electrical power, confidence was what made antebellum America hum. Confidence was black magic, good fortune, and hard cash combined. Confidence could turn worthless paper into glittering gold, cow towns into cities, empty lots into bustling businesses, losers into winners, paupers into millionaires. Confidence was a charm deployed by bankers and merchants, philosophers and politicians, clergymen and card sharps alike. Confidence was the soul of trade in the words of a leading financial publication. Without it, added Herman Melville, commerce between man and man as between country and country would, like a watch, run down and stop. In an age before the federal government began printing paper money, an age when people had to trust in privately issued banknotes, which were basically glorified IOUs, confidence was the de facto national currency. So this guy, James Jesse Strang, was very much a person of his times, and as I, that those times were the antebellum period. And most people who are familiar with the Clark Library will know that's the decades leading up to the American Civil War. Um, and he grew up, uh, hmm. uh, uh, let me see, this isn't working. Uh, uh, oh. I'm not sure what to do here. Uh, um, I may have to, something is glitching out on my computer here. I may have to, uh, you know what, I'll stop sharing this PowerPoint and I'll call it back up. How about that? Um, Um, hmm. Oh, there we go. Now it's working. I have no idea why that is. Um, okay, so Strang grew up in what was called then the Burned Over District. He was born in 1813, and the Burned Over District was uh, Western New York, basically. 
And it got its name, the Burned Over District, because it had been scorched by so many religious fires. Um, some new religions came out of there, Mormonism for one, and notably for Strang Mormonism. But the place was also just the most heated place for uh, traditional Protestant religions, which this was the Second Great Awakening. And um, people were just had religious fervor and fever. And young James Jesse Strang, who grew up a poor, small farm boy in Western New York, um, was contemptuous of all this. He kept a secret diary when he was a young man, and we luckily still have that diary from the time he was about 18 or 19, the time he was about 21, 22. And he wrote his secrets in that library, in that, in that diary in code. And one of the things um, he uh, recorded was first his absolute contempt for camp meeting for this type of religion, which he thought was completely fraudulent. And second, um, his atheism. He was a secret atheist. And third was his own fluency with religion and his own ability to convince and persuade other people when he spoke about religion. He grew up in a Baptist home. And so he had this education. He had this world around him. Um, and, but he was, he was contemptuous of it, but he was also very good at it from a young age. So you see from the start with Strang, two kind of strands. One is idealism and one is opportunism. All right, so Strang um, failed at many things in Western New York. He uh, was a country lawyer and didn't do well at that because he kept kind of taking people's money and um, uh, blowing his clients off. Um, and he was a postmaster, which was a big patronage job. Then. Um, and he was also a failed newspaper man. But when the one thing he was good at was uh, convincing other people to give him their money, and even that backfired on him because he sold reportedly some land in Ohio to someone in New York, but the person went to Ohio, <laughs> found out there was no such uh, landowner as James Jesse Strang and came back to New York. And so Strang had to fly by night. Um, and this was a common thing in the antebellum period. Um, people could go and remake themselves on the frontier. And the frontier that Strang chose was Wisconsin, which was then still a territory. Um, and he moved into a little town called Burlington, which is, um, some of you may know, a couple hours northwest of Chicago. And he um, uh, moved in with some friends of his who happened to be Mormon. And he set up law practice. And at one point, he was in Illinois on a law case. And a friend said, hey, you want to go to Nauvoo, the Mormon capital? So. And he said, sure, I'll go. And uh, Nauvoo was, uh, some of you may know, an amazing place. So this is in Western Illinois, along the Mississippi River. We see this picture here. Nauvoo at this time was arguably bigger than Chicago in terms of population. There were probably 10,000 people living there at that time. Um, and Strang, while he was there, met Joseph Smith the prophet and founder of church, uh, 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 the Mormon church. And um, uh, he converted to Mormonism. And we'll never know whether his conversion was real. That's something I, I don't think we can know. But in any case, he left Nauvoo a Mormon and went back to his little town in Burlington in southern Wisconsin. Now I'm having the same trouble I had last time. Going to my next slide. There we go. Okay. Um, oops. Boy, oh boy. Sorry. Um, Frustrating. Okay. I will cycle through these and I've now figured out how I need to do this. Okay. So there we go. 
Okay, now we should be good. Please excuse me. So, um, in uh, 1844, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was murdered near Nauvoo. Uh, Joseph Smith was killed. This is a picture of it. And shortly after Smith's murder, James Jesse Strang started telling anyone who would listen that Joseph Smith had secretly passed over, passed along the Mormon church to him and made him the next prophet. So he posted this letter, which I think there's a copy of it at the Clark. Um, it was, it's actually being held at, at Yale at the Beinecke Library. And Strang started showing this letter around. And this letter purports um, to be from Joseph Smith and purports to pass the Mormon, the whole Mormon church over to Strang. Um, this would be uh, like making a private in the army the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It just wasn't very plausible. The people at the time were sus very sus suspicious of this letter, um, uh, Mormon leadership. And since that time, um, some modern experts have declared it's pretty much clearly a forgery, but a very good and very clever forgery in certain ways. Strang and used his experience as a postmaster to make sure the postmark on this letter was right. There was a postmark from Nauvoo to him in Burlington. Uh, it's quite possible that Joseph Smith had written him about something and that Strang had taken the outer paper because there weren't envelopes then and folded in a new letter. In any case, he immediately took this letter around and began showing it to uh, members of the church who, who most of them told him to go away. They didn't, they didn't buy it, but he just, kept at it, and he was an incredibly persuasive person. And uh, in 1845, he led some of his small group of followers um, to a hill in Burlington, Wisconsin. And they told them to, that an angel had told him they must dig in the earth. And they, uh, so they dug down and they dug up some brass plates that looked like this. This is a, a, a replica of what was on those brass plates. He called them the Raja Manchu plates. And they were um, written in a language that luckily only one person on earth could possibly translate. We see that language there on the left, the script. Uh, and it, that person was James S. E. Strang through uh, uh, help from God. And uh, he was able to translate this script. And you will be surprised to know that it was further evidence that James Jesse Strang was the chosen prophet to lead the church. Well, this may sound goofy to us now, but at the time, some people were very convinced by this. As you may recall, Joseph Smith um, had dug up what we call the golden plates, which on which the Book of Mormon was, was based. And so this idea of uh, divine revelation and of mysteries buried beneath the earth was very, very attractive uh, to the mid 19th century mind. Um, and, I, you know, I just to give us a sense of how that the, the what was happening in the mid 19th century mind, I want to just show two iconic figures from this period. On the left is Phineas T. Barnum, P.T. Barnum, the great showman, um, the professional fraudster, trickster, um, and on the right is Karl Marx. Um, and these people were both very influential on their times. And they're not often put side by side uh, in, in talks like this, but I think they're very closely related. They're total contemporaries of Strang. Con uh, the, it, Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto with Engels in 1848. And I think that period that, 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 this, that really described the time Strang was living in, which were a period of great um, upheavals, dislocations. Um, you had a technological revolution going on, the railroad, the telephone, I mean, the telegraph, the photograph. These things change our ideas about time and space. America was just really mobile at this time for, in ways it hadn't been before. And so people were moving out of their towns and it was, became a nation of strangers you had to trust people in a way you didn't before. Um, you had to have confidence in them. Um, it was also a time of incredible religious and political upheaval. Um, it's the time the women's movement is being born. It's the 
period leading up to the Civil War, so abolition is going on. And I think there are just certain times in history when the truth becomes more porous and the sense of um, a solidity becomes uh, just not possible. And Marx and Engels wrote about this. Marx used the phrase that I love, all that's, that is solid melts into air. Um, and I think Barnum understood that. He understood that nothing was really solid during this period. And so Barnum and others from this period took advantage of that. For instance, T.T. Barnum in his museum in New York was called the American Museum. And it was a hugely popular place. He had curiosities like this. This is a mermaid that he claimed to have purchased. Um, some people would come to his museum and say, uh, that's not a mermaid, that's a monkey sewn, uh, to, sewed to a fish. And um, Barnum, instead of saying, no, that's not possible, would say, uh, you know, some people say it's not. Why don't you bring your cousin and your good friend and come back and pay admission tomorrow and why don't you try to figure it out more? You can take another look at it. So Barnum was always sort of playing with the truth and, and understood this idea that there wasn't a lot of soli solid fact, there wasn't a sense of solidity. And so this is also the period in history when the term confidence man is born. And we know exactly when that term, it, it, it starts. It starts in a New York newspaper in, uh, 1849, and it spreads through the country just like crazy. Um, and the reason for that is because there were so many of these characters around. Among the people to comment uh, on this sort of American fascination with confidence men was this guy, Charles Dickens. Um, Dickens, uh, Came, I'm sorry, Dickens came to America in uh, 1841. And he was, he was kind of surprised by, um, by Americans. He didn't like the United States very much, which might have been some English snobbery. But he was also just um, taken aback by a lot of things. For instance, he went to my home state of Illinois and visited the town of Cairo. And in Cairo, he, um, he met and, and in other places, he met confidence men. And um, I'm gonna read you just a quick passage of what Dickens had to say about Americans and our fascination with confidence men. Because, um, so he met this guy who had committed uh, a real estate fraud and a lot of people suffered and people in the town thought he was pretty great. Um, so Dickens wrote, the following dialogue I have heard a hundred times. Is it not a very disgraceful circumstance that such a man as so-and-so should be acquiring a large property by the most infamous and odious means, and notwithstanding all the crimes of which he has been guilty, should be tolerated and abetted by your citizens? He is a public nuisance, is he not? Yes, sir, came the answer. A convicted liar? Yes, sir. He has been kicked and coughed and came? Yes, sir. And he is merely, and he is utterly dishonorable, debased, and profligate. Yes, sir. In the name of wonder, then, what is his merit? Well, sir, he is a smart man. And this was something about Americans um, that uh, the idea of a smart man or a, a, our smart dealings, which basically were cons, that Americans somehow admired. Um, and it was, it was interesting that Strang from the very start of his colony surrounded himself with some of the great smart men of his times. This is one of them. This guy's name is John C. Bennett. He, um, among other things, was um, a, a, a snake oil salesman, literally. That was kind of his thing is to sell fraudulent medical stuff. Um, uh, one governor of Illinois called him the greatest scamp in the Western country, scamp not being a nice word. He had been in Nauvoo uh, and we, in fact was, became very close with Joseph Smith um, and was a very shrewd politician. He had, was, had been able to get for Nauvoo um, 
from the Illinois legislature, including uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was in the legislature at the time, um, a, a charter for Nauvoo that uh, essentially uh, gave them quasi-independent status uh, in that um, in that place. And Bennett was also a um, weirdly a big proponent of the health benefits of the tomato. It was like one of the things he proved to be right about. Um, but he um, was kicked out of Nauvoo because of his um, uh, sexual uh, uh, scandals. Um, Polygamy was by then going on at Nauvoo, and in fact, Bennett had been very encouraging of Smith and others to practice this, but was a little bit too open about the practice and didn't, um, wasn't uh, quite able to give it the religious sheen that other people um, did. And so he was booted out and he was uh, kind of down and out, but Strang took him in and uh, together they came up with the idea of um, uh, taking Strang's colony, which was then in Southern Wisconsin and moving it north. Um, there were a couple of reasons for that. One was in Burlington, it, it, Wisconsin was kind of a, just a little prairie town and you could get in really easily and out really easily. And that wasn't so good for Strang. Um, uh, uh, he at first attracted a ton of leaders of the church, or not a ton, but including Smith's brother, one of Smith's brothers, and um, uh, but these church members would come to Strang and they would say, uh, you know, they would quickly find that they, they didn't quite believe in him. And meanwhile, Strang's followers would come to this little impoverished town to his utopian colony, and they would just go away. And I think Bennett was the guy who planted in his mind that he needed to move north to an island where he could really control things. Another guy that Strang surrounded him with was this guy, and he is one of the great uh, <laughs> figures of the 19th century in a lot of different ways. I, I don't mean great in terms of important, but if anyone embodied the bigger than life period of the 19th century, it was this guy, George J. Adams. Uh, this is a picture that made him extremely angry and I, that I think uh, I'm uh, dug up myself. Uh, it's, I, I don't, I've never seen it in any other work. Um, it's uh, Adams performing Richard III on stage. He was a Shakespearean actor and a Mormon preacher. He was also uh, uh, like an infamously bad actor and uh, an apparently incredibly good preacher. He was also um, strange for uh, a, a person of the Mormon faith. He was a notorious drunk, a notorious womanizer, uh, and uh, the New York Times wrote that his body odor was so bad that if he borrowed another actor's clothes, they could never uh, wear them again. And so he too became aligned with Strang. He also had been a, a top person in Nauvoo, had gotten kicked out of the, the church for his own sexual misdeeds, and he came to Strang's church. Adams is interesting, I think, because he had a kind of a literary life after Strang. Um, this guy knew about it, Mark Twain. So long after Strang's colony, Adams started his own colony um, in the Holy Land, um, and it was a disaster. Um, and uh, a lot of people died and other people just suffered uh, greatly. Um, and when Twain was working on Innocence Abroad, he met some survivors of this colony and uh, wrote about what a dangerous man <laughs> Adams was and what um, what a con man Adams was. At least one scholar, and I think he makes a good case for it, um, claims that Adams was the basis of the king in Huckleberry Finn. And as you recall, um, one of uh, uh, the king's thing, king was a con man who worked with a partner in Huckleberry Finn. And one of the things they did is, is go around and um, perform uh, Shakespeare uh, and, and badly. And so I think that that's quite possible that that's true. Twain was really impressed uh, and not in a good way by Adams and, and wrote about him in Innocence Abroad a little bit, but I think he did save him up for, for Huckleberry Finn. Okay, here's another extraordinary con man for, uh, from Strang's world. Um, this is uh, Elvira Field. I mean, uh, this is Charles J. Douglas, and I just gave away a little punchline. 
uh, Charles T. Douglas was Strang's uh, uh, traveling secretary and nephew, supposedly. In 1849 and 1850, Strang traveled the East Coast for months with this man and, and introduced uh, him as the, you know, sort of business associate. In fact, uh, Charles J. Douglas was a woman in disguise, and she was, in fact, Strang's first thorough wife. Um, Strang had been famously the anti-polygamy person, but uh, in his, uh, and, and that was a part of his draw to his colony. Um, so when he traveled with Elvira Field in 1849 and 1850, he didn't want his, no, his flock back in Wisconsin, and now uh, some of them had moved north um, to know about this relationship. But he also didn't want his first wife and, and remaining wife to know about Elvira Field. Um, but eventually, um, Elvira uh, uh, took off her men's clothes and uh, returned to being um, uh, a woman. Uh, well, she was a woman, but um, uh, just wearing women's clothes um, and, and settled down. I mean, one of the interesting things about this book, I got to say, is gender relations in the mid-19th century. Um, if we look at this photograph, I mean, we maybe wouldn't be that convinced by it. And, and some of the people who met Strang weren't convinced either. There were people at the time writing, you know, Strang is running around with a woman in, in men's clothes. Um, but other people were really convinced. And, and one of the interesting things for me learning about this period was that the, um, the signifiers for femininity were so strong. Dress was such a part of how we constituted womanhood in the 19th century. So women were wearing, you know, nine petticoats sometimes. These very ornate clothings, uh, clothes to show their sense of uh, femininity. And so I think what happened was people just didn't know what to make of what appeared to be a woman in man's clothes. So it was a very interesting thing. So anyway, eventually Elvira and Strang in 1850 went back to Beaver Island, which is this little island at the top of your screen, uh, very uh, northernmost Michigan. It's a very beautiful place. I'm sure some of you have been there. Uh, given uh, the audience. Um, it's also a very far away and, and isolated place. And in eight, the summer of 1850, Strang appointed himself um, the king of earth and heaven. And there was a, a very formal ceremony. <laughs> he, he was, uh, he was um, crowned on a throne made of, stuffed with tree moss. And George Adams, the uh, thespian uh, uh, sidekick, brought a bunch of stage props. And uh, for the people there, I think it was a, a really big deal. I use this illustration. It's it's from Hans Christian Andersen's um, The Emperor's New Clothes, which was which was published in the United States just before this, in fact, and would have been very much on people's um, minds or some people's minds. Because it, it always kind of reminds me of how farcical this ceremony seems now when you read about it. But to the people, the 250 or so people who were there, it was a really big deal. They thought they were bringing in a king. They thought they were bringing in someone who would usher in the second coming of Christ on Beaver Island. They found it to be hugely important work. And um, if we think the notion of a quasi-independent island nation in the United States is funny, and in some ways it is funny, this guy didn't take it seriously. That's Millard Fillmore, the president of the United States at the time. And Fillmore uh, in 1851 came to see uh, Strang as enough of a threat that he sent in the U.S. Navy's first iron-hulled warship. This, is, this impressive vessel is the USS Michigan to invade the island and bring Strang to justice. So uh, the Michigan was dispatched. Uh, the raid took place. Strang and a bunch of his followers surrendered. They were brought back to trial in Detroit. And the story should have ended there, <laughs> right? The colony should have been broken up. Strang probably deserved to go to jail. We'll talk about that in a second. 
but it didn't happen. Strang was found and his followers were found innocent on the charges against them. And so in 1853, when Fillmore left office as one of the least effective and popular presidents in US history, King Strang was still in power uh, in Northern Michigan. And um, so he really had quite an influence. And he was very, he was much written about uh, at the time. Um, and one of the, the questions about Strang uh, that is really important is whether he was running a pirate colony out of um, uh, Beaver Island. And I've got to say, like, I think my book, The King of Confidence, ad advances our knowledge of that a little bit. Um, uh, there have been other authors who argued that it was all anti-Mormon propaganda. There were all these reports of um, Strang's dispatching small ships to raid um, coastal cities along Lake Michigan. Uh, and they'd show up and they'd, they'd attack and steal stuff and then head back in the ships and head back up to Beaver Island. And some people have claimed like, this is all anti-Mormon propaganda. There was plenty of anti-Mormon hatred. Uh, it was a terrible thing. As we know, the people in Nauvoo were forced out and forced to move west to Salt Lake City. Um, and, and strange people also suffered, um, you know, prejudice, religious prejudice. But I think one of the ways my book really uh, advances this story is um, um, by um, pinning Strang down and his people down um, in committing crimes, not only these raids, but horse, horse theft. He would dispatch people all over the Midwest to steal horses, which were a really valuable commodity. Then. And, and one chapter in the book, um, I have some research that other people don't have about a, a, a trial in little Perrysburg, Ohio, which is a little town um, in uh, northwestern Ohio um, that um, documents sort of uh, day by day by day. Um, first, one of Strang's top lieutenants comes to town. Some horses are stolen. The man is tracked down hundreds of miles away, brought back to justice. He's put in jail. Strang shows up in town. The editor of the local newspaper says, uh-oh, it seems like something's up with Strang. Um, there's a, uh, the guy is convicted. He's, uh, his conviction is overturned on a technicality. There's a lot of stuff in the newspapers about, hey, was the sheriff bribed? Uh, and then the guy remains in jail and then there's a jailbreak and he's gone. And so, I think more than anyone before me, one of the things I'm proud of in this book is just kind of um, it, it, here and elsewhere, showing that whatever else can be said about Strang, good or bad, he was indeed running a pirate colony. Um, but I've also, I also uncovered some, some stuff that I think helps us understand this really positive, at least to me, hugely positive side of Strang. He was a life or a, his old adult life. He was an abolitionist. And um, uh, I think I've fleshed out why he was. But I just want to give you an example. In the Michigan legislature, um, Strang managed to get himself elected twice, not once, but twice to the Michigan legislature. And, he, and, his, and his territory was like a third of the geographic region of Michigan. And uh, something really strange happened because even the newspapers that had hated him and called for his arrest um, suddenly started saying, well, wait, this guy's really smart. He's a good speaker. He knows how to do legislation. And they were also impressed by his uh, kind of courage as a politician. So Strang was a Democrat and um, he nonetheless opposed the Fugitive Slave Act, and it opposes strongly. And um, people in this audience probably know exactly what that is, but it, just in case you don't, in 1850, there's this, Congress passes this law that allows slave catchers from the South to come into to Northern um, states and take slaves back, escape slaves back. And um, Strang helped um, the fight for what was called a personal liberty law in Michigan, which just undercut 
uh, the Fugitive Slave Act. It made it really hard for slave catchers once they got to Michigan to, um, to bring slaves back. And I think in my research for this book, one of the things I've done is found some incidents from early in Strang's adulthood, uh, an incident when he went to Virginia and saw the evils of slavery firsthand. Um, and I think it really impressed him and really stuck with him. I, I, I write that the one thing that I think Strang actually believed in, con men don't believe in much. They're, 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 they change with the winds, but Strang believed in abolitionism. In fact, um, uh, voted against his, his own um, party's interests, but also his own best interests um, when he was in the Michigan State Legislature on this issue. Um, and so here's Frederick Douglass. <laughs> Um, Strang's newspaper uh, ran a story uh, by Fred Douglas, as the uh, uh, byline says, um, and it's really an interesting piece because it's, I couldn't find this excerpt anywhere else in any other newspaper in the country. And I looked hard. It's from a, a, one of uh, the memoirs that Douglas published in his lifetime. And it was just out, so it was new material. And clearly someone had read the book and found this passage. And so in one, on the one hand, it's, we get into the idealism and the opportunism of Strang. On the one hand, it's very idealistic. Here's this newspaper uh, on Beaver Island running a, 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 an excerpt from a memoir by Frederick Douglass, this great abolitionist born a slave. On the other hand, the excerpt he ran was really interesting because he ran this excerpt about when it's okay for slaves to steal from their master. And I, it strikes me that for Strang's followers, that would have really resonated in their own lives. They were engaged in this, in this kind of theft that they excused because they thought they were doing more important were, they were consecrating, as they called it, for this greater good, which was to bring the second coming of Jesus Christ to Beaver Island in their own uh, lifetime. Um, and so that was one really interesting aspect of the book. So another interesting, whoops, another interesting aspect, whoops. Uh, let me flip through, sorry. Um, Okay, another interesting aspect of the book is the issue of pantaloons. <laughs> so th this is a lampoon uh, from the, the abolitionist period, or the, the, the antebellum period, sorry, showing um, uh, this idea of women in pants being somehow macho and uh, dangerous. Um, Strang, women were wearing pantaloons on Beaver Island a year before Amelia Bloomer, the great proto-feminist, began dying them, and they became called bloomers and affiliated with the women's movement. So in some ways, Strang was very progressive and in, ahead of his time. But as with everything with Strang, it, it kind of cuts both ways. As time went on, pantaloons became a very controversial subject on Beaver Island. So, um, uh, more and more uh, uh, people uh, objected to wearing them, women, and their, their husbands objected to them wearing them. And um, uh, I think it became like um, masks are and have become in our own time, where it became as much a political symbol of, as an act of dress. And so there was this pantaloon rebellion on, on Beaver Island in 1856, and it was obviously much, much more complicated about that. And I talk about it in the book. But essentially, um, those opposed to Strang were really opposed to him about this emotional issues of their wives or, or themselves having to wear these pants. And Strang just asserted his authority and said, and issued an edict, all women will wear pants on this island. Uh, and again, it seems kind of absurd to us now, but it was really a big thing to these people. And um, um, under undergirding that controversy was another one that took place in this house. This was Strang's house, um, was the issue of polygamy. 
by the end of his life, Strang had five wives. Uh, four of them, by the way, were pregnant at the time of his death. And polygamy had never been popular on the island. Even Elvira, the woman who, who toured the country with him in men's clothes, later wrote that it, it just wasn't a popular thing. And so this rebellion happened in 1856. Um, Strang was uh, murdered by a couple of his own people, probably with the help of the US government and the state of Michigan who were in on the conspiracy. Um, and when he died, um, his his um, murder made uh, front page headlines in the New York Times. And I thought I would just um, uh, kind of close with that. I mean, we can, uh, we can talk about, uh, there's so much to talk about with this guy, but I'll leave you with, with King Strang um, uh, dying. Uh, we can talk about what became of the colony afterwards. But since we're almost at quarter till, I think it might be a good time, um, Frank, if you're ready to do it, to take some questions. Oops. Frank, you out there? Yeah, yeah. I had to get my mic unmuted there. And okay. I didn't want to unmute. Um, well, I guess I would start with a question. Why don't you take a few minutes and talk about what happened? James Jesse Strang is assassinated. And you want to just share that story and talk about what happened to the colony and bring the, bring the story oh, yeah. close. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely glad to talk about that. Um, so this plot against Strang um, was probably, as I said, involved the U.S. government and, 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 and Michigan, but it was, it was an internal um, group of disaffected people. Strang had a way of uh, making people really, really uh, angry. And um, uh, a growing plot came against him. And he, he was, um, what happened is the, the USS Michigan, the boat that had raided the island a few years earlier, came back. By that point, it was just making regular stops on the island. And then actually Strang had a good relationship with the captain and the crew. And and um, the, 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 the ship stopped on the island. The captain uh, sent a, a, an aide to Strang's house and said, hey, why don't you come down and, and talk to me on the boat? And Strang, according to people who were with him at the time, knew something was up. And so he walked down to the boat and, and, and in these giant wood piles on the piers at Michigan Island because um, the locals sold uh, wood to steamboats. That was the big uh, export from the island. Um, we're hidden a couple of Strang's former uh, followers. And um, as he walked towards the boat, they gunned him down. Um, they then fled into the boat, which um, uh, promptly sailed. Um, um, it took um, Strang a long time to die, three weeks. He was cleared out of the island. Um, uh, and taken back to Burlington in Wisconsin, his first colony, <laughs> where he died. Meanwhile, no one was ever tried or, or convicted. Uh, then no one did a, a, a moment in, well, some some guys did a, a few months, <laughs> a night or two in jail for his murder, and that's it. Um, uh, he, his assassination made headlines uh, worldwide, uh, but um, uh, his colony didn't last. Um, a mob of uh, people who were opposed to him uh, raided the island shortly after he was uh, shot and, and forced the Mormons out at gunpoint. Um, and so when we go to Beaver Island today, we say very, like what we what's left of, uh, uh, of his colony are the place names, but there really aren't a lot of buildings. You can't really um, uh, see, uh, huge evidence of the colony there anymore. Um, uh, and partly that's just because people were all, uh, the colony was forced off the island. There's these really sad newspaper stories about these people suffering. The, the, the mob took all their money, all their clothes, all their possessions and just said, go. Um, and so they were, um, uh, you know, just sent off with nothing and uh, started showing up in, in Green Bay and Chicago and other places. And uh, 
Um, Strang's branch of the church never really recovered. He hadn't named a successor. There still are some Strangites in Burlington and, and in other areas. There's still a very small group of Strangites. I'm not an expert on them, but I, I've met at least one of them. So, yeah. I do have a question if there's any Strangites left in Michigan. You know, I'm really, aware of. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really know about Michigan Strangites. I, there, there may well be. I, I, you know, I'm certainly not an expert uh, on the Mormon Church in general. But um, but on that branch of the church, I, you know, I I, I have some um, social media communication with people um, in the church, and I and I met one of them in person in, in Burlington. I had a nice conversation with them. Um, uh, it's you know, I, I I mean, it's interesting that that even after all these years, with sort of no structural. Um, uh, uh, so no infrastructure, the church has survived. And um, uh, one of the great things for me, <laughs> and, and, and this is just giving the library, um, the Clark some credit too. I mean, like members of the Brighamite church, um, the Strangites were great record keepers and they kept everything, even in this sort of uh, massacre on the island. And so there is so much of Strang's correspondence. A lot of it is, is, is at Yale, but the Clark has some amazing stuff. Um, and, you know, Strang's diaries. And for me, for as a writer, it really allowed me to make like kind of a, a rich three-dimensional portrait of a guy from the distant past. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you, and they revolve around your discussion of the piracy, and they're all how in heaven's name, or I use that term not facetiously, did yeah. Strang's uh, community justify such a thing? Well, so let's just take a step back and, and start with, with Nauvoo. Um, uh, there had been a, a history of this in the church. I, I mentioned that Nauvoo had a charter that gave it sort of quasi-independent status in Illinois. And um, this was beneficial to the church in, in, in a lot of ways that you can imagine, but it also attracted kind of um, a lot of uh, outlaws <laughs> to Nauvoo um, because they had a certain amount of kind of protection there, some of them within the church and some of them out of the church. Um, and so there there had been a history of this kind of crime uh, before and it was so there's this idea of consecration in the in the mormon church and I, if if there are any mormons in the audience i want, I want to be really clear that uh, consecration is for for many people a very good thing it's just giving to the church it's you know tithing uh, it would be another way of thinking about it but in nauvoo and then later on beaver island there developed this idea of consecrating other people's property so frank i would come over to your house and consecrate your property and, and, and why did, how did people justify it? I think they justified it. I think um, I write in the book that there were different types of people. There were these very cynical con men with, with Strang. And I can't believe that some of them, um, you know, they were basically, some of them were kind of thugs. But there were also these true believers, people of faith, you know, who thought they were doing a greater good um, and thought that their prophet wanted them to steal from other people so that the colony could survive because Beaver Island gets down to 40 degrees below zero, you know, sometimes in, <laughs> in the winter. And, but, but also um, um, because, because they, they, they thought they were bringing around the second coming. They thought they were doing the most important work you could possibly do. Okay, thank you. I've got another follow-up question, and this is about Elvira, who a couple of people are really interested in. Yeah. And they're particularly interested in her take on the bloomers. You know, she traveled with Strang, obviously, in disguise. Yeah. Was she a proponent of bloomers? Did oh, you think she was it was a big, yeah, she was a big proponent. There's a reporter who came to Beaver Island shortly after Elvira um, um, had, had, had done her tour on the East with Strang uh, in men's clothes. And this reporter comes to Beaver Island and um, notices that women, women are wearing pants. And it, it seems that Elvira is one of them. Another, uh, he's a member of the church, but he's not a, a Strangite, comes to see Strang's coronation. And he sees uh, Elvira in, in these pantaloons. And 
Um, she has sharp words for him when he when he criticizes her. Elvira was such a fun person to write about. I, we don't know her. You can't know her as well, Strang. But she was such a strong, interesting woman. Um, she, um, uh, of all strange life, she had a different role. She she wrote for the newspaper when she was traveling around as as Charles Douglas. She um, performed certain religious rituals. But later, for instance, um, Strang was in on so many things. He had such he was so in, a, such a keen mind intellectually. Um, he worked with the Smithsonian Institute on what this cloud crowdsourcing weather experiment that people all over the country started recording uh, weather data daily. And Elvira did that on the island. And you can go through Smithsonian records and see this. And this is no small thing. This was what allowed us to find out that storm fronts move west to east and allowed people to say, hey, uh, you know, there's a storm coming two hours to the west by a telegraph and to understand. It's really how we start to understand and are able to forecast weather. I'm not saying Strang was like on the front lines of that, but he was doing daily records and Elvira was the one who did those records. So in some ways, uh, she led a really important and vital role on, in this colony. I, I really found her to be a fascinating uh, woman. And I also, one of the fun things I should just say about my readings in this book, I mean, is um, just understanding the complex gender relations of this time, reading like the great proto-feminist Margaret Fuller's book, um, which is just, which is, I think it's called Women of the in the 19th Century. Um, which is just amazing. I mean, it it literally talks about stuff that we're talking about today. It I think it uses the word fluid and talks about gender fluidity. It's fascinating stuff. And so I, I really loved working on Elvira. Okay, one last question about Elvira. Someone asked if she had any connection to the emerging feminist movement in other parts of the country. Did she ever talk about it? Or is there anything you yeah, know about I, that? I mean, it's, so it's really difficult to, um, because Strang was very controlling on one hand, and I think the pants, pantaloons were a means of control, but I also think Strang was very progressive in, in, in many ways. You know, when he and Elvira were touring the East Coast in 1849, he welcomed an African-American member of the church. And this is like, um, the Brighamite branch of the church, um, Brigham Young was, well, he has a complex history, but for much of the time a proponent of slavery. Um, there's a, a thing in, in the Book of Mormon about dark skin being related to evil. Um, the mainstream Mormon church, I don't think they let an African-American member of the church until like 130, maybe 150 years after Strang. I can't remember the exact number. but. Strang was very progressive about race, and I think he was progressive about women. And uh, if anyone in that uh, in that group was uh, uh, you could call a proto-feminist, it would be Avira. One of one of Strang's other wives, uh, who he married as a teenager when she was a teenager. Well, he did with Avira too, but um, went on to be a, quite a uh, interesting woman herself, a, a frontier doctor in the West. Um, and kind of an independent-minded person too. So it's it's hard for me to say. I don't think they were part of any formal feminist movement, but but strength politics were in in some ways very progressive. Okay, I have I have an additional question here, which takes us back from Avira to James Jesse Strang. It's very straightforward. Where is Strang buried? Oh, he's in Burlington. And I, I if anyone wants to do the the Strang tourism, I mean. I think going to Beaver Island is fantastic and worth it anyhow. Um, and there's some cool stuff to see there. The print shops are there, and there's a really, really nice museum there. Um, small but but great. And the the the, the, the Beaver Island Historical Society is fantastic. But if you want sort of more palpable strang tourism, go to Burlington, Wisconsin, which is a lovely town anyway. Uh, great coffee shop, nice bar uh, there along the 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 white and fox rivers where they meet in, in southern wisconsin and there's still because the houses there were built of stone there's still real evidence of strang his graves there 
um, you can get much more of a feel for uh, a, a colony. And, and uh, you know, I think um, Strang hangs over Burlington more than uh, Beaver Island in another way, and that there's still Strangites in Burlington. You know, I, I first learned about this, about Strang. I have a, a brother-in-law who I consider a good friend who I, um, who grew up in Burlington. And I, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I don't know what it was. I was visiting him and, and, and his parents uh, in Burlington, and he was driving me around. And he started showing me these old houses and said, you know, and start telling me this amazing story about this colony that had been there, uh, you know, in the 1840s. And um, and then he said, yeah, I mean, I never remember him saying I grew up around these guys. You know, there were there were people from this church who I went to school with and who lived down the road. And it, it, it was fascinating to me. OK, I have a question which you may or may not want to touch. The person asks about the parallels between Strang and modern day confidence men in our country is very striking. Is history repeating itself? Yeah, you know, so um, I don't mention um, uh, 2020 at all in the book. There's one oblique reference in the prologue, and there's one oblique reference in the last chapter, the last line of the book. Um, uh, but I do think that there are periods in history when um, we can't agree on basic truths, right? And and when we can't agree on basic truths, that's when these confidence men thrive because someone like Strang can come in and um, offer simple answers to complex questions and um, can um, can win people over by making up his own truth and arguing for it um, vociferously and in a charismatic way. Um, and so I purposely avoided writing about contemporary America in the book, um, partly because I, 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 I want to be very careful. I, I, I think history reflects itself, but I, I don't, I, I think you can go too close, as you guys know at Clark. You can go, you don't want to make an overly simple comparison between two eras. But from the first time people started reading the book, you know, when I sent out for the blurbs, um, a reader start, was sought as um, a an allegory for our own times. And, and you know, Frank, that doesn't that doesn't bother me. I like that. In fact, I, I saw it as an allegory for our own times. I just didn't want to say this is an allegory for our own times. Um, but but I but I will say this. You know, like like um, my experience with the book, I started writing it about the time that President Trump started running for president and, and I was writing it all through the, the same period. And, you know, without getting into politics, I think Strang helped me to understand Trump and Trump helped me to understand Strang and living in the era we live in now really helped me understand Strang's era where, where we just, I mean, I have good friends who we, we have, to, not good, good friends, oh, I do have good friends who I don't agree with about politics, but I have old friends, I should say, who, uh, you know, I had to stop a Facebook conversation recently because I realized we didn't agree on the basic truths, right? Like we didn't, what was absolutely truth to this guy was crazy to me and vice versa. And so, you know, this was the kind of time Strang was living in too. I, I, I had actually very similar thoughts reading the book in the last couple of days. Um, I don't have any other questions, but I do have one brief announcement that I should have made at the beginning of this presentation. And uh, it's that the John and Audrey Cumming Endowment is going to uh, subsidize and pay for the presentation. I'm very grateful for the for endowment. Now. But I'd also like to say John Cumming, who's a former director of the Clark, built that collection. He was fascinated by that collection, and he would have loved this presentation if you were still with us to uh, enjoy it. Well, I'm so proud to be uh, to be here and to be part of this this uh, this library. Uh, um, uh, uh, John Fierce was so kind to me when I was up there. Um, and I I got it. I have to admit something to you, Frank. I I kept procrastinating on going up there to the collection. I'm so glad I did. I did it near the end of my research, but there were a couple of things that were absolutely vital to my research. When I got up there, I just kept hitting myself on the 
had. And luckily I was there in a morning when there wasn't much going on so they could get me the materials and I was able to, I mean, it really had a good chance to spend some serious time with everything you have there. But it's, and also, can I just say the Clark is just an amazing place. It's beautiful. Um, I, I suppose everyone on this, in this webinar knows about the Clark, but I, I had heard about the Clark many times. You can't research Strang and not notice that there's a lot of stuff there from that. But I, it's an amazing library, and I am, um, I feel really honored to be um, a part of their programming. Well, thank you, Matt. It's very kind. I have a question for you because I just got a note here saying it's a fantastic presentation, and I'm going to run out and buy the book. And we had talked earlier that you might be able to send me some book plates. I'd be glad to. Just let me know how many you need. And, uh, and you know, too, uh, Frank, I guess we, should, we could talk about this privately. If there are book plates, I have book plates from my publisher, Little Brown and Company. But if there are uh, book plates from the library uh, you want to send down, I could sign those, too. Oh, uh, Little Brown is fine. So for okay. those of you who are listening, if you, if you get that book to the Clark Library, I'll put a request into Miles, and we will get a book plate that you can glue into your book. You know, and I, would I would just say, Frank, what I'm saying, and, and it, this is going to sound like P.T. Barnum hard sell, but, <laughs> um, but I, maybe I should flip back to the mermaid on this. But it's something I'm saying in these talks. Um, uh, writers and bookstores are really hurting in COVID, and I, I've been blessed with this. This book has gotten a lot of coverage, um, much to my surprise, and I think my publisher's surprise. But I guess... I, what I would say for my book and for other books is if you at an event like this and, and you're interested, just just buy the darn thing. Um, you know, no, I spend endless hours in bookstores browsing and we just most of us just don't have that luxury right now. Right. Even with some bookstores opening. Uh, I don't know. I, I, last time I, I was in uh, Michigan in the late summer and uh, I went up to um, uh, 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 Petoskey, McLean and Aiken hoping to browse <laughs> and they were totally, I mean, they weren't closed. You could order a book and they'd leave it out front. I, I don't know. It's just, I, I think if you like, if you're interested in this book, please just go out and buy it. Don't wait. All right. With that, uh, P.T. Barnum would have been proud, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think P.T. Barnum would have, would have claimed that the, the book, uh, you know, uh, I, it cured your uh, stomach ailments or something. <laughs> anyway. Yes, you probably would have. And it would have helped your long-term memory and cured dementia on top of that. Well, it, it will do that, Frank. That, that's, <laughs> I guarantee it. All right. With those ridiculous uh, comments, thank you so much for joining us today, Miles. I appreciated it. I'll let you know if we need any of those autographs, and we'll get them to the people who have let us know that they bought the book. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. And we're going to end the uh, end the presentation here tonight. So thank you and good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.